Okay, so welcome back. And as we mentioned earlier, the public health ideas for creating housing and equitable cities, uh, we uh, offered some pilot grants last year. And then among the many um, very excellent um, um, proposals, we were able to fund four of them. Actually, five, because another one we just started. Um, for the four of those uh, grant proposals, we are funding last year. And today, you're going to see how they uh, showcase the research. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. So today, our first speaker is Dr. Rick Nazel. And um, Rick is a professor of environmental health sciences and global health he serves as the director for the Center um, for Occupational Health and Safety Engineering, and also the associate director of the Office of the Global Public Health. His research focuses on evaluating and addressing harmful exposures in workplaces and communities around the world and his research team places a very strong emphasis on translating the research findings into practice. So without further ado, let's welcome Rick. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and it's such a pleasure to see everybody here today in the room and online. Uh, so I'm gonna speak for a few minutes if I can get the controller to work here on uh, the pilot study that again has been funded by our School of Public Health. And so uh, we are very intentionally addressing environmental injustice that's occurred in uh, the city of Detroit uh, with focus on a specific environmental hazard that almost always gets ignored but really shouldn't be and that's noise. So just to get our bearings here, we're sitting, of course, in the city of Ann Arbor at the School of Public Health here. And if we were to travel about 42 miles to our east, we would end up at Interstate 375, which is just a, a one mile spur, basically, of uh, highway, uh, but a very important one mile, as we'll see. And so for those of you who have spent time in Detroit, I've used my very crude cartographic skills here to show you maybe some, uh, some landmarks you're familiar with, the GM Rensen, uh, Comerica Park, and Eastern Market. So we're, we're right in that area just east of downtown Detroit. So if we were to look at that area back in 1959, we would see something like this. This is Hastings Street uh, in a, a very vibrant neighborhood, a thriving neighborhood called Black Bottom. On the other hand, if we fast forward to 2021, when this aerial photo was taken, this is what that neighborhood looks like today. So it's essentially a, a six lane, 55 mile per hour, depressed freeway, depressed in, in many <laughs> senses, uh, but in this case, meaning uh, underneath the um, uh, ground level. And so I'll just highlight here that the placing, the siting of this freeway to the east of downtown Detroit was done quite intentionally and just resulted in the destruction of two very thriving black neighborhoods or majority black neighborhoods, uh, Black Bottom and Paradise Valley. And so these areas continue to be predominantly black in population today and uh, in effect are experiencing ongoing uh, ramifications from this environmental racism that occurred when the freeway was built. So we are trying to better understand the uh, ramifications of this environmental injustice. So uh, just to, and I apologize, I've just gotten prescription uh, <laughs> readers here, and so you may notice I'm a little awkward with my reading here, uh, and that font is about 20 points smaller than I'd hoped it would be. Uh, so it turns out the Michigan Department of Transportation, as well as the Federal Highway Administration, have both explicitly acknowledged that government policies played a role directly leading to this environmental injustice. Now, Detroit has actually received $100 million uh, from the Department of Transportation to redesign I-375 uh, in the words of the agencies to help right this past wrong. That sounds like great news. And so the idea here is, well, let's take out I-375, which is a failing freeway from an infrastructure perspective, and let's replace it with a nine-lane boulevard uh, to connect these neighborhoods again. So if that doesn't sound like a great 
uh, approach to connecting neighborhoods, you're absolutely right, at least that's our thought. Uh, now MDOT, the Michigan Department of Transportation, estimates that the sound levels around the freeway currently are in the, the range of 66 to 72 decibels. So that's a, a little louder actually than I'm talking to you right now, uh, that they're exposed to 24 hours a day. Now I don't have time to go into the literature, but I will say we have a, a tremendous body of evidence showing that long-term chronic exposures to those levels of noise can cause hearing loss, but they're also strongly linked to cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, heart attacks, stroke. So this is not a trivial exposure that this neighborhood uh, is experiencing. Now uh, MDOT, again the Department of Transportation, has done some modeling to estimate, well what might uh, noise levels look like if this project goes through, and we fast forward to the year 2040. And they think that noise levels will be up about five decibels. They have determined that to be a, a finding of no significant impact or a Fonzie, not the cool kind of Fonzie like I grew up with in, on TV, um, because MDOT doesn't care if the levels change less than 10 decibels, which is uh, essentially a tenfold increase in how much sound exposure there is to this community. So that's troubling. Uh, beyond that, MDOT has determined that noise mitigation approaches are not feasible for this neighborhood. In other words, we shouldn't even try basically to, to quiet this uh, prog uh, project. I'll also highlight there was similar work that was done between 2018 and 2022 on Interstate 75 as it runs through Detroit. And there's been a ton of complaints and, and essentially reevaluation of that finding of no significant impact. So there's already some evidence that doing this sort of thing doesn't improve conditions for communities and can in fact make them worse. So uh, a little bit more on what MDOT did. So we're focused on noise again, this ubiquitous uh, stressor. So MDOT, as is commonly done, used mathematical models to predict what levels of noise might exist in this neighborhood following the proposed work. Uh, but they did that in, in, we submit, a very flawed way. They took a very limited set of measurements at a very limited number of locations on a single day in 2017, in October, actually. Uh, and so we have taken some issue with this. They, for instance, have predicted, well, we think the 4 to 5 p.m. range is going to be the, the noisiest time of day in that year, but they didn't even make measurements during that time of day. It's uh, hard to support that assertion. Uh, I would also submit, and I think folks would agree, Detroit has changed dramatically from 2017 to 2023. There's been a lot of uh, new development there. It's not the same city that it was uh, six years ago. Uh, and then MDOT themselves have admitted, yes, there will be impacts on about a quarter of the residences uh, that are around this freeway. But again, they've said these impacts essentially aren't enough to obligate us to do something about it. Uh, another way to frame that is, well, the situation's already bad and we're not really making it worse, which is not how public health should work. I think we can all agree. So the question for us becomes, well, what can we do to try to help this process and address this environmental injustice? So we have two aims of our research. The first is we want to go out and do a more robust assessment of noise. So we're actually going to develop um, a, a sampling strategy essentially to go out to the same spots that MDOT did their measurements and do a much more robust um, measurement campaign at those same locations, but looking not on a single day, but repeatedly over time so we can start to understand and you know, MDOT's snapshots, how representative are they of reality, seasonal differences, that sort of thing. Uh, and then we're going to compare our results to MDOT and determine how accurate or valid we think their estimates are compared to current conditions. The second thing we're going to do is develop and implement some novel methods here. So as you saw from the previous slide, typically noise levels are measured with a meter that you just park at a given spot and it sits there for a while and collects measurements. We are moving into more mobile monitoring. So we're actually going to use a U of M vehicle and we're going to drive around this area around the redevelopment, which is highlighted in the, the bright orange lines there. We're going to do an internal route that's uh, close to the freeway, that's in green, and then a farther away route in blue, and get a better sense of what's actually happening at all of these locations, not just a few snapshots like MDOT did previously. So this is going to give us a much better ability to understand at a more granular level what a noise exposures look like for the folks in this neighborhood. 
Now, we've actually been out uh, quite recently, in fact, and the team has collected some initial data. So um, the photo on the lower left corner there is our team actually driving around the local Costco parking lot before uh, they were driven out <laughs> by management, uh, collecting some measurements in a, a, a sort of wide open um, area with, with few obstructions at a very advanced hour of the morning, as you can see. Um, and then we have gone out and made an initial round of measurements in Detroit, again, at those same 13 locations that MDOT measured back in 2017. The graph here on the right is showing noise levels. Um, uh, so we're looking at, on the x-axis at noise levels that were measured there. And then we've got all 13 of the measurement sites on the y-axis. Now, the bars connecting the little black dots to the red or blue circles essentially are showing how have the sound levels changed today compared to 2017. And I'll highlight that 10 of the 13 spots that MDOT measured are much noisier today. In fact, three of the spots are more than 200% louder today than they were in 2017, which again brings into question MDOT's fundamental assumptions about whether and how this area should be redeveloped and done so in an environmentally um, responsible way. So just to summarize here, in terms of urban health significance, uh, we are going to be able to essentially provide an independent assessment of MDOT's own work. We're also going to get a better understanding of the risks to the nearby community from the new development. There's pretty well understood relationships between noise and hearing loss and cardiovascular disease. So if we know what the levels are, we can actually predict what the impacts will be on the community. And this is providing great opportunities to establish connections with the impacted folks in the community, which of course is, is critical for any type of community research. And then moving forward, we're actually already planning a, a much larger grant proposal here to start to look at the impacts of noise and air pollution as well. When we look before the project at our baseline, ideally monitor during the reconstruction and then see what the final outcome is and how well that matches MDOT's predictions as well as our own. And so we can start to ask this question of, well, does redevelopment, which sounds promising, but does redevelopment of intentionally racist past construction actually provide current modern health benefits to these marginalized communities like the ones that were driven out of Black Bottom and Paradise Valley. So we're hoping again to address and help the community um, feel more empowered to respond to this environmental injustice that they're still experiencing. So with that, I want to thank my co-authors, Abash Kembi, Lauren Smith, um, Shin Zhang, and Andrea Kennedy. Thank you to the school, of course, for the funding they're providing. And uh, I'd love to take any questions or, or comments you might have. Thank you so much. Okay, um, I did a project on this exact redevelopment in uh, Amy Schultz's environmental health promotion course mm -hmm. last year. Um, and one of the things that was interesting about this redevelopment is if you go back to your last slide where they had the green space, it's actually not, all the parts that are green on the redevelopment of the highway are not necessarily gonna be developed into green space. They're gonna be developed as, they're just parcels of land that are going to be created by redeveloping it. And I'm wondering, as somebody who's interested in noise and its impacts on the environment, how, uh, how that's being factored into your research because green space obviously would have a different impact on noise than if it ends up being buildings or something else, right? Yeah, I, I mean, there's undeniable benefits to maintaining and increasing green space in communities. We know there's mental health benefits and, and perhaps other uh, physical benefits. So the, the notion of green space resulting from this reconstruction as you would take away from this, um, this drawing essentially from the, the project development team is good. Now, whether or not that open space is actually preserved is an entirely different issue. And you might imagine from a noise perspective, if that remains grass, for instance, versus becomes an urban forest, uh, that's going to have different influences on how the noise travels through the environment and how it impacts the surrounding residents. Um, it becomes kind of difficult to tease out, well, what are the impacts of the noise when you consider the fact that, gosh, the noise level's the same, but there's trees now and it's nicer to look at. So some of those things are, are very much open areas of, of research. Um, but I will say if our larger study that would look longitudinally at this development is funded, then we could start to ask questions like, well, gosh, this block was developed into a building. What were the impacts on the noise exposure and therefore on the community's health risks? So it's a great point and something we'd absolutely con uh, consider.
So we can, uh, we can assume that uh, MDOT just uh, pretty much um, avoided or, or, or had no interest in an actual true evaluation that there might have been political considerations in their determination years ago. What are the chances now for bringing forth the results of your uh, reevaluation in terms of having an impact with MDOT and, and the current political uh, situation? <laughs> Uh, it's a great question, and to be clear, I, I don't know that MDOT uh, intentionally did, a, uh, let's say, a limited uh, review or survey in 2017, but it, it certainly is scientifically not, um, not robust enough for, for my um, uh, sort of desires, which is why we're doing this reevaluation. Our idea is if we can get this done by spring, we can share that then with MDOT, we can publish on this, and if we can show, hey, the assessment that was done many years ago now under, let's say, less than ideal scientific um, rigor conditions doesn't appear to be valid essentially today, I, I would hope that that could be used to steer them towards changes. Uh, projects like this, of course, are years in the making and then years in the, the actual construction, so I think we're not too far along, uh, but yes, our, our goal is absolutely to engage with MDOT once we have data in hand and to say, you know, either your assessment was valid or it's not, and here's the reasons why, and here's why we, we recommend something be done about this. Thank you so much for Thank you, All right, so our next speaker is Professor Allison Miller from House Behavior and House Education. So Miller and uh, her team has many exciting research projects that are concerned um, young children who are growing up in the poverty and or those who have experienced early life stress to um, other social determinants that can negatively impact their health during the childhood and across the lifespan. Um, Professor Miller has worked with the community partners, including pediatricians, community-based organization, uh, Head Start programs, and also the school systems and UM colleagues across disciplines to translate the research findings into intervention approaches that may ultimately reduce health inequity and foster positive health and well-being for the children and families. So without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you, it's really fabulous to be here. And I have to say after that panel, I'm not sure all of us were here, but I was like, how is this gonna connect to young children and families, which is sort of always one of my questions. And it totally did. I was like making all these connections and I wish the mayor were still here, but I told him I'd reach out. So um, I'm super excited to talk about this project. Uh, we call it a place-based approach to healthy IPSI. And um, uh, really growing out of connecting clinics to communities to families. Um, so this is how it connects to young children and families. So we know that kids and families living in urban centers that have experienced lots of the stressors we've been talking about this afternoon can face stress. We also know we have lots of research showing that early life stress is actually really harmful, can be to young children. And when I'm talking about young children, I'm talking about zero to five year olds. So sort of infants to preschoolers, basically. Um, it's associated with poor health and outcomes across the lifespan. What we also know, to put a positive spin, is that early relational health or relationships with parents and supporting caregivers in the environment can really buffer this. But what happens is that often social needs get in the way and sort of social stressors in the environment. And so parents and caregivers are not able to sort of muster those resources to buffer those experiences for their young children. So pediatric medical homes are an approach to kind of engaging families in the communities where they are um, and a place-based way to reach families. Um, we've also found that um, in pediatrics, screening for social needs, I'll talk about a little bit what those are in a minute, um, the idea behind screening for social needs is to, to connect families to the resources in their community that can actually help to address some of these social needs. Um, this is not always achieved. So the goal with this project was really to look at social needs screening in the clinic and connection to community resources on behalf of meeting child and family needs. Um, and so we, or we uh, I, will sh I will share what we, what we did, um, but we talked to um, clinic, community, and family um, players in this system. 
Um, this is, I know this font is small, my apologies, but this is just an example of the Michigan Medicine Social Needs Screener Questionnaire. Those of us who've been to Michigan Medicine possibly have filled this out. So it's things like, in the last 12 months, did you skip medications to save money? Are you worried about food, utilities? Um, social isolation, I think, also came up in the panel. We ask about that in the, in the PICQ screener. Um, the, there are three categories there. GAP stands for Guest Assistance Program. That's a, a social worker that works in Michigan Medicine that basically tries to connect families with social services. MSW is more maybe what we typically think of as social worker, connecting with like mental health needs. And then community, so transportation, these things that don't sort of fall in an easy box. And that's an interest of interest to us because kids and families who are existing in cities that have maybe limited transportation or other things um, might need to access these resources. But um, newsflash, they are difficult to access and often not available. So, um, whoops, whoa. Okay, some of my thing went away. Anyway. Um, Oh, maybe did my font just change? Sorry, <laughs> there's a font thing going on. Um, so our guiding question really was how do kind of the clinic space, community providers, and um, families in the city of Ypsilanti work together to um, kind of meet these needs? Where are the sort of sticking points and um, how do we sort of create these connections to ensure healthy families and ultimately healthy cities? And sort of the converse, the healthy cities would be able to support and grow healthy families. Now I'm ready to move on. Okay, um, so this summer um, I was so lucky through the um, public health ideas um, funding to have um, working with four fabulous interns. We were there in a green space, another way this connects to the panel. Um, and we, con we conducted, at the beginning of the summer, I will be honest and say, oh my gosh, I don't know how we're gonna get all these interviews done. We had great plans and I'm not sure if it's gonna happen. We ended up talking to 13 people in the clinic. Um, 17 people in community organizations and 30 parents. And I'm just gonna say, those of you who've done data collection, <laughs> talking with people and recruiting them over one summer, it was amazing. Um, so shout out to the, to the interns, some of them are here and all of whom have posters upstairs. So um, in terms of methods, we sort of uh, worked with clinic-based staff around, um, these are sort of who they were. We've talked with pediatric colleagues, family medicine providers, those two types of social workers I mentioned, and the administrative staff, so the people at the front desk basically, like how does this work in the clinic? Do people come in and get a questionnaire? Do they fill it out? Do you enter it in a database? So we asked about this process of screening for social needs and connecting families with resources. Um, we also spoke with community organizations, so leads in the community, so around childcare, around housing, sort of broad range of social needs um, that families may, we may have and may interact with these organizations around. Um, we sort of did snowball recruitment for that because we'd say at the end of each interview, hey, who in the community would be really good to talk to about how children and families work with pediatric clinics or how you work with clinics or don't work with them to kind of address the needs of kids and families in this community. Um, about their insights. And then we also talked with um, parents of children, again, in the zero to five age range to see like, what's happening in your well child clinic visits? Are you talking about social needs? What else are you talking about? Um, I study relational health. That's very central to a lot of my work. So we also asked about that as a topic and where parents would maybe wanna learn about things in this space. So I will say um, these are very initial themes, very big picture, and I know it's text heavy, so. Just bear with me. But overarching theme number one that really came across very clearly was this challenge in creating a rigorous and equitable process for social needs screening. And this was within the clinic, things like, well, we don't always have you know, the wherewithal to enter the data, but we do hand out the questionnaire, just sometimes it doesn't get entered. We don't always have an interpreter on site, so sometimes we can't reach families who need a language that we don't have on site. Lots of different barriers we can imagine. These are, these are commonly kind of written about in the social needs screening literature and pediatrics. Um, other things that kind of came up that aren't always written about were things like the specific wording of the questionnaire, so the social um, isolation, for example. People were like, I don't know what you mean. Is it that I have friends or don't have friends? Do I go out of my house or don't go out of my house? What is that item? So there's a lot of sort of interpretation and imperfections within the measure, um, as well as difficulty connecting families with the different social workers and different options. Um, Speaking of connecting families to resources, this was of course another barrier, and this really I think connects to the Healthy Cities piece. And so 
We know that there is limited capacity and overwhelming need, particularly in the areas of housing in Washtenaw County that was mentioned by like every single community-based provider, whether or not they did housing. And a lot of them were like, we're just overwhelmed by the housing needs here. Um, so need for that. Also need for mental health in lots of different ways. We know there are long waiting lists. We also know that the care and interactions that families have with a lot of mental health service providers are not optimal. And um, so that sort of creates an additional challenge in even accessing services that may be available. Um, I've listed some other things there. Um, I will say also it was very interesting in talking with community organizations about their awareness of when leadership changes happen and families' responses to those leadership changes in different organizations in terms of kind of feeling welcomed, feeling respected, you know, having you know, stigma around engaging in services. So that was a very interesting theme we're delving into more. Um, and then the other piece that's really important that came out um, was just the need to build relationships and sort of, I, I think like, yay, early relational health, but not only among parents and children or even parents and providers or even children and providers, but among the organizations that are serving families and children. And that doesn't really um, come out in a lot of literature, but it's so critically important. And the, the people who we spoke with in the community organizations who are sort of most engaged were like, I'll just call up my friend at this organization because I know that person and I know they know how to get this family housing, even if my organization doesn't do housing. So that idea of relational health across the systems and across sectors um, was very important in our interviews. And the idea of a warm handoff to somewhere. These are also just some specific findings we, that came out from the parent interviews um, in terms of what they talked about in well-child visits, so with zero to five-year-olds, ERH, early relational health, early relational health promotion, and so, for example, book reading that was mentioned in the panel, that's an example of early relational health because you're gathering with your child, you're reading a book, you're sharing this time, hopefully before bedtime. Um, and, and doing some reading. But most families also did not report discussing social needs with their providers, um, so there's sort of a gap there. The other thing that also came up in the panel was um, families had interest in finding out about these resources in other settings, and so they mentioned, for example, libraries. Great setting to meet, uh, you know, to reach young children and, and young families. Um, the other thing that came up were um, around resource finding challenges. So this was true for providers. Providers are like, I could screen a family for social needs, but then I don't know where to, what, where to you know, send them for resources. Um, so findhelp.org is this um, web-based tool that Michigan Medicine and Trinity Health have um, are sort of collaborating with and putting into the um, medical record. So a lot of organizations didn't know about that. Some providers knew about it. We found out about it across the course of the summer in talking with Michigan Medi Medicine social needs screening leads. And so this might be a way to sort of connect families, providers, and community orgs with resources in the community because you enter your zip code, you say, I need diapers, and it pops up a place where you could get diapers. Um, of course, the challenge there is implementation, so we're talking about that. Um, and there's a tiny font thing. Oh, wow, it's really tiny. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, it's that social workers are all still mostly working remotely and everybody would like them to be in person except perhaps for the social workers. So that is a big struggle because everybody said, we need a warm handoff with somebody who knows me and I'm not gonna answer the phone. You know, if, some, if I get a cold call from Michigan Medicine as a parent, are they gonna, you know, take my kid away? So it's much better to have people in person, but they're not yet back in person. Um, and so next steps for this research, again, like I said, this is like first pass, early stages. But um, we've been working in the context of this whole project with um, YHC's Ypsilanti Health Center, and um, they're undergoing a redesign and moving actually to a bus line, which has been a big issue because they have not been historically on a bus line. So I loved the focus on care communities and the mobility of um, young families, like they have strollers, they have little kids, they don't walk far. Um, it's really helpful to be on a bus line. Um, and so we're sharing results with the staff around that redesign, the pediatric uh, clinicians who are involved with this project, and also the bigger sort of Michigan, me Michigan medicine level um, social needs screening teams. Um, because they've been rolling out the social needs screener and pro across a lot of different clinics and are very interested in sort of like, how's it working? Where are the barriers? We're like, we can tell you. <laughs> 
Um, so around the redesign, we're giving recommendations, um, and we're also offering support to community organizations to sort of register and engage with Find Help, this web-based resources, if that's desired. Um, and so some of the posters upstairs are about that. Oh, and actually at the bottom of my thing, it's supposed to say see posters. So there's like four awesome posters that are in the poster session that have more details, and um, we'll complete manuscripts, et cetera. And my really tiny font, so sad, um, says thank you to everyone. So the particular um, pediatricians in the YHC setting are Jenny Radusky, who's a developmental behavioral pediatrician, Lauren O'Connell, who's a developmental behavioral pediatrician and was like, had worked with Dr. Mona and Flint around the water crisis. Um, and then Layla Mohammed, who is the medical director at Ipsy uh, Health Center for Pediatrics. Um, all of the interns um, who are Sydney Strunk and Wadad Atani and Annie Clark and Zue um, Adams and for public health ideas and my SPH collaborators um, who are in environmental health, Olivia Halibicki, Sarah Stein, and, and uh, HBHE, um, and then Rebecca Sokol, who is in social work. And I think that's everybody, but I really can't read any of that. So if you can, that's great. Um, and that's it. I don't know if I have time for questions. I have one minute. But. <laughs> All right, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Jiyang Song from Biostatistics. Dr. Song's research interests include Bayesian approach and survival analysis, special analysis, statistical learning methods. Dr. Song is particularly interested in developing the new statistical methods for cancer genetics, uh, radio mix, and opiate overuse. And recently, she just started a few new projects on the firearm injury prevention for the urban areas, and also studying the impact of greening projects on the prime crime reduction. So Dr. Song, welcome. All right, thank you so much for the kind introduction. And I'm so excited to present uh, my first grant um, from the public health <laughs> as a young postdoc researcher. So today I would like to talk about um, developing a spatial temper model to assess the impact of the greening projects on crime reduction. So gun crime definitely is still the significant public hazard in urban center, especially in Indianapolis in Indiana. So if you see the picture on the left-hand side, um, and if the is a kind of like the crime change from 2008 to 2020. And if the block is color or red, and if the color is even darker, that implies that the crimes actually increase in, within these blocks. But as you can see, most of the maps are actually coloring red. So this kind of implies that the city is still battling for this violent crime. So to tackle this problem, um, we started to look on the project called the Greening Initiative to revitalize the vacant lot in this area. So, especially in Indianapolis, there is a community partner called Keep Indianapolis Beautiful, KIB. So they are a nonprofit organization who's been continuing this greening project in this area from 2008. So from the picture, like they kind of um, plant the trees or flowers and make the new garden in this area to make this community beautiful. And they actually been choosing two to three sites every year for this project. But uh, of course, like in this project, it's important to identify the relationship between the crime incidence re reduction and the greening initiative. But this research might not be inconsistent due to some confounding uh, factors. This confounding factors could be race or like uh, poverty level, et cetera. So if I give you the example, so if there is a big racial disparity between the green spaces size versus control sites, then like those, like the crime rate variation may not be um, caused by this greening project. It could be done by this racial disparity. So it's very important and significant to address this confounding factor in this project. 
So this uh, confounding factor questions brought me to three research questions for this project. First of all is how to address these confounding factors. And secondly, of course, it is regardless to say um, that the importance of to verify the influence of the vacant lot reuse projects on this crime um, rate of reduction. But in this project, we will mainly focus on the violent, violent crime rate or firearm involved the crime rate. So lastly, um, we can also like can check the socioeconomic status on this violent crime rate, which I call it in the social vulnerability in this project. So with these three ideas, I like to talk about um, how to see the this greening project impact on this crime rate. So uh, this is my analysis plan. Sorry, I'm a more statistician, so the way I solve these questions are more statistical method based. So uh, when we check for the first questions, how to address these confounding factors, uh, I like to uh, use these two approaches. First with propensity score matching, and the second is instrumental variable analysis. So basically, the point of these two approaches is to make the fair comparison between the green spaces and the control sites so that we can really see the true impact of the green project on this crime reduction. And for the second one, to see the, to investigate the, the green project for this crime reduction, uh, I would like to approach, uh, use the approach for the spatial temper model because all the sites are located in a different place and then there are crime rates are changed over the time. So it's very important to address this location variance and the time variance. So that's why I choose this spatial temper model. Plus, um, even though we consider this confounding factor for the first research questions, still the data set might have the selection bias because what happened was that the site is not chosen at random because like our sites are chosen based on the application. We chose the best one be within our application, so it's not random, so meaning that there still have some selection bias. So the, the method that I choose here they have some robust way to address this selection bias. Um, so that's why I like to use it in this project. And for the last one, for the socioeconomic variable, I like to use them from the US Census website. Um, this variable could be the percentage of like the non-white population or percentage of like a low poverty level household. So um, in this presentation, I'd like to give you some insight of the data set that I have. So still this result is base, based on the initial data set, which is updated up to 2021. Um, so for this, to address this confounding factor, here I already formed 34 pairs from the greening spaces and the control sites. So in this stage, we didn't use propensity scores or IV analysis. We just paired them based on the racial decomposition of the each sites so that they, they, this pair has a similar yeah, races. And this will already kind of helps to address this, um, this confounding factor to make them as a balance. And for this analysis, uh, I use the outcome, which is the crime instance or the crime rate from each site. Um, this is counted monthly level from the each site within the half a mile from each site. And we kind of measure them two years before or two years after this greening uh, project begins from each site. And for the covariates, still they're all from the social vulnerability, which is from the US Census. Um, so this plot uh, shows the patterns of the average crime rate across the sites. So the first, first plot is the total violent crime rate. 
Sorry, the font was a little bit uh, small now. I don't know why, but for the right one is for the firearm arm related the crime rate only. So if you see the x-axis, the middle part, which I indicate as a zero, is the point where the green project begins. And from the left side, negative one and negative two means that uh, one year or two years before the project begins. The right side of the zero, uh, that Im implies the time point where the one year or two years after the project begins. So from the center, and the y-axis is the crime rate, and we have uh, two lines. The red one is the crime rate plot for the control sites, and the green one is from the green species sites. So as you can see, after the green project begins, they all have kind of like the reducing patterns, but if you see the red one, it kind of jump up. But for the green line, um, the crime rates keep reducing. So with this crime rate plots, it already kind of shows some idea that this green project is working in Indianapolis. And if you see further for the firearm arm um, crime rate only on the right hand sides, after the project begins, they all kind of decrease. Um, but for if you see the decreasing rate uh, for the control sites, uh, the rate is kind of slow down. This decreasing is slowing down compared to the green space. However, the green space, the crime rate keep continuing to decrease and with a constant pace uh, compared to the control sites. So we kind of had some idea that this green space projects are working in um, this area. As a furthermore, uh, we also can draw some variable causal relationship between this, um, this all the covariates and the outcome variable. So I'm sorry, the one on the top here, the, the one on the top is for the green space variable, and the circle on the bottom here, this one is for the outcome variable, which is our crime rate. So from the green space variable to the outcome variable, there is no direct line, meaning that they don't have a direct causal relationship between these two variables. But between these two variables, there's a lot of variables, which is from the socioeconomic variables, and they all have the, like, the line toward to this crime rate. This kind of gives some idea that these variables are, has some connectivity or relationship, but through other variable. This plot shows some idea that that's why we need to bring this socioeconomic variable in this study to address these types of indirect paths from the green spaces to the crime rate. So from this relationship from the green spaces to the crime rate and also all the relationship within the socioeconomic variables, uh, here is my next plan to where to go. First of all, this initial uh, analysis is based on some initial cohort that we like, we're ready to update our data set, which is up to 2023, um, so that we will create the new pairs of the control and the green spaces sides. Uh, of course, like I will apply the propensity scores or IV analysis this time. And secondly, I would like to apply the spatial temper models, um, but I already gave you the two ideas. I like to actually apply them all into this analysis and compare which one is more easy to be applied for the public health study, and if one is more efficient, then that I'm willing to apply um, and like promote more through the GitHub and through the, my own website. And lastly, uh, I also like to include more covariates. Uh, here, the initial analysis only based on the socioeconomic variables, but the team is working very hard to collect more variables related to the community engagement. So hopefully, uh, we're ready to, uh, we, we complete this collection as soon as possible so that I can um, implement them onto the, yeah, for this project. So that's all for my presentation, and thank you so much. And if you have any question, feel free to let me know. Yeah.
Um, so last but not the least, we'll have Professor Paul Fleming from uh, Health Behavior and Health Education. So his research focuses on the root causes for racial health inequity and the strategies to address them. And today he is going to talk about improving the urban health with unarmed non-police response programs. And welcome. All right, well thank you. I get to um, be, I think, the last presenter of the day. Um, so first off, just wanna thank the school for the funds that supported this project and also for putting on the, the event today. It's been a really rich discussion and I'm, um, I'm excited to be a part of it. So what I am presenting on is our Care in Cities project. Um, and I wanna make sure I acknowledge some key team members that were crucial to this project. So Wolfgang Barr, who's an MPH MSW dual degree student, um, Hannah Mesa, who's a project manager, and Alex Parks, who's a recent alumni. Um, we worked together on kind of the presentation that I'll be sharing with you. So this, this project focuses on police violence as a public health issue. So over the last um, decade or so, there's been increasing recognition that police violence is in fact a public health issue. Um, as some kind of research that's been done or documentation of this, of course, I do wanna acknowledge that uh, residents of cities have been saying this for years and decades, um, and it's only recently that researchers and other folks in the, um, in the broader society have recognized it and thought of it more as a public health issue. But researchers have documented that each year there's about over 50,000 youth that are injured and sent to the emergency department um, as a cause of injuries as the result of uh, police contact. And that every year there's over 1,000 folks who are killed by police in the United States. Um, and that, that number has been consistent and actually increasing in, in the most recent years. Um, police violence disproportionately affects folks who are most marginalized in U.S. society. So um, it, it in particular affects uh, black individuals who are f at five times more likely um, to be injured. And um, some work by Michael Esposito and colleagues who uh, here at the University of Michigan documented that police, uh, being killed by police is actually the sixth leading cause of death for young black men in this country, um, which is really staggering and tragic. Um, other minoritized and uh, marginalized folks are disproportionately impacted by police, so that's including folks um, who identify as, as Latino, Native American, um, who work as, as sex workers, uh, who have mental health issues. All of those folks have been documented to be more likely to be impacted by police violence. So given all of that, police, policing is a public health issue. Um, the American Public Health Association um, has declared police violence um, a public health issue. It's a cause of racial health inequities. So when we talk about racial health inequities, we need to be talking about how policing happens in our cities and in our communities. Um, and, and the American Public Health Association has recognized that it is, it is in need of public health solutions. Um, so a lot of the conversation within public health so far has been showing the harms, documenting some of the statistics that I just shared. Um, but where public health has done less on is what, is what do we do about it? What are the interventions? Um, there are many folks who are working on this, but one example is um, thinking about alternative responses to policing. So what can cities or municipalities put in place as an alternative resource in their communities, alternative to policing? Um, and this is really important for a variety of reasons. Um, one is that alternatives to policing um, may be seen as more trustworthy, right? So there's, it's very well documented that there's certain folks within a city or a community who are unwilling to call 911 because they fear what might happen when police show up to their communities. Um, folks who are undocumented, folks who are disproportionately impacted by police violence, um, communities where a number of the folks are incarcerated or part of the criminal legal system, right? Those are places where they might be hesitant to call 911 because it can be a pathway to these, uh, these harms. So alternatives to policing such as unarmed non-police response programs are increasingly recognized as a potential uh, strategy to both reduce police violence but also to increase residents' access to life-saving resources. 
Um, there's some research that shows that uh, somewhere between 33% and 68% uh, of 911 calls um, could be redirected to alternative response. Um, you know, many folks, including myself, might argue that it's even a higher percentage than that, but at kind of a baseline, there's some easy ways that instead of sending out armed police officers to respond to these, it would be much more effective and much more in line with public health evidence to be sending out people with different types of training, training like social work, training in de-escalation, other things like that. Um, Growing evidence, while it is still limited because um, there isn't a lot of history of these uh, types of programs, but growing evidence is showing that it is both um, cost efficient and effective at uh, reducing police violence and better connecting residents with resources. So these unarmed non-police response programs really represent um, a, a promising public health response to both the issue of police violence, but also uh, the issue of marginalized residents being disconnected to resources when they are in crisis or in, uh, have emergencies. So the project that the um, Ideas Initiative funded uh, for us is really trying to answer two key questions, um, which is what are the key pathways for the relationship between an unarmed non-police response program and public health um, and reduced, reduced health inequities? So basically, how do we think about this, this connection uh, between the two, the two? How does funding for an unarmed non-police response program actually lead to better health outcomes in that community? Um, and then the second one is how can we evaluate these programs for improved health and reduced health inequities? In a lot of cases in cities that are considering these types of programs, and Ann Arbor is one of them, um, there are a few other places in Michigan, um, but there's also places across the country that are experimenting with them. Um, in a lot of these cases, people are talking about them strictly as a um, either a crime reduction tactic or they're thinking of them as a way to address other issues. They're not always thinking about it as this can actually improve community health. It can improve health outcomes. It can reduce health inequities. And so that's what we're trying to bring with this project is a public health lens to this conversation. Um, and so ultimately these research questions um, these research questions are gonna help us, help public health have a foundation for how do we do research on these types of programs. So what are the pathways that it can improve health and how do we actually evaluate these programs with a health lens? So to do this project, we started off by doing um, qualitative interviews with folks who uh, work within these types of programs. Um, so as I mentioned, there are different municipalities that are experimenting with this across the country. Um, most notably, uh, there's a program in, in Denver. There's one um, that's recently started in Atlanta, in Durham, North Carolina. Um, there's one actually operated out of the health department in San Francisco. Um, the longest standing one is out of Eugene, Oregon. A lot of folks have heard of it. It's called CAHOOTS, um, and some of the newer programs are starting to try to model themselves after that response program. So we started with key, um, key informant interviews with folks who work within those types of programs across the country to really ask them questions about how do you see your work having an impact on health? Um, again, these folks don't always identify within the field of public health. They don't think of themselves as necessarily working on issues of health equity, um, but we got to ask them how do they see it um, having impact on health. We did a thematic analysis on those interviews um, and used that to really develop a logic model. Um, the reason that we wanted to create a logic model for, and, and for those of you who don't work within logic models, logic models really lay out what are the investments that can lead to certain actions that are gonna lead to certain outcomes. So what we really wanted to do was what is the logic model for cities investing in these programs? What are the resources that a city needs to put forth? What does the program need to look like? And then what is that gonna lead to short-term, medium-term, and long-term outcomes in health specifically? So we developed this logic model to show how, um, how uh, unarmed non-police response programs can lead to long-term better health outcomes. Um, and from there, we're actually later this week, we're, we've assembled a panel of experts that includes both um, academic experts, but also folks who either lead or participate in these types of non-response programs to really sit down together. Um, it's essentially a focus group slash expert panel to sit with our logic model and try to 
try to tease through it, see where can we add, what can we change, how can we make sure that this logic model best represents how these programs can contribute to uh, improved health outcomes. The other piece of it is measurement, right? So when cities are thinking about how to evaluate the impact of these programs, how do they think about it with that public health lens? So we're also gonna be asking this panel of experts, how would, you, how would you measure this, right? Because the outcomes that I'm thinking about as a public health person, somebody who's thinking about um, health inequities, the outcomes I'm thinking about are access to life-saving resources, um, health outcomes. I expect to see these programs having an impact on chronic disease management, um, issues of uh, suicide, mental health. Um, I expect all of those outcomes, but folks who are working in this or cities who are investing in are not always thinking about those types of health outcomes. Um, so how do we evaluate these programs and make sure that health evaluation or its impact on health is integrated into the rollout of these programs across the country? And ultimately, this, we hope this all kind of leads to um, a more systematic approach that we can put out into both the public health world, but also disseminate to policymakers for how these types of programs are going to improve uh, public health within their community, reduce health inequities, and better enable their residents to, um, to thrive. Um, so I just want to share, uh, we've, we've, we've done the part where we've interviewed uh, folks who work at these communities, um, and some of the quotes, you know, that are from some of these responders, and I think that's been really powerful to actually talk to the folks that are part of these teams that are doing response, right? Um, so as one, uh, one person who works at the uh, Atlanta program um, said, I feel like their overall health and outcomes are better when we respond because we understand the community that we work with. We're a very diverse team and stuff like that, so I really feel like we make a huge impact on people's well-being when it comes to addressing the whole spectrum of health and well-being. And I think that's a key difference between this type of response and what most police departments in the United States, how they are responding, right? Police departments, the way they are set up, the way that cities have been asking them to set themselves up is that they are a pathway to the court system, to probation, to prisons, right? Um, whereas these types of response programs are a pathway to public health resources, social services, thinking about um, how, you know, how to heal from some of the harms that have happened. And so they're, they're fundamentally different and you can see the way that a lot of these programs have been set up have been intentionally focused on building that community trust that so often is highly broken down between police and communities, right? So it's fundamentally built on this trust and also having a team that reflects the community at serving. And as one of the responders um, from the Durham Heart Program said, we literally and figuratively save lives in a community. Um, and so they're out there, you know, delivering Narcan to save in the cases of overdoses, but also connecting folks to life-saving resources. Um, and so, you know, this, this question about how does it impact health, you know, I think this Durham Heart responder really hits on the head is they're literally out there saving lives um, is one key aspect, but then we also know from a public health lens that there's gonna be all these other spillover effects that are gonna have a positive impact um, on, on a community. So I'm really excited about these programs for their ability to really rethink how we think about public safety within communities and better um, provide folks with resources needed to thrive. So. Um, that is all, but again, just want to thank all the, uh, the folks who helped fund this, um, and that's all I have for today. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, so I would like to thank all our speakers for sharing all this exciting and impactful researches, and uh, let's give a big, another big round of um, applause for all of them. So with, with that, I'm going to welcome our Dean Bowman back on stage for some concluding remarks. So uh, I'm really, 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 really pleased with uh, how today's events have turned out. I think many uh, just fascinating conversations. I want to thank our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Isabel uh, Angelowski. We had a wonderful exchange. Uh, on the panel, people 
with very, very different perspectives, contributing to important work, but from different areas of expertise, all important pieces uh, to, to, to moving us forward. And then uh, lastly, our lightning talks work uh, seated here within public health ideas that uh, I'm really excited about, really excited to see a lot of that work uh, contribute as it, as it matures and moves forward. So I, I wanna make a couple of uh, announcements. Uh, first, this is again the inaugural uh, event of this exchange series. We are already beginning to plan the next one. Uh, if we can move to the next slide. So the, uh, during the winter semester, the second exchange event will feature Brandon Wolf uh, on February 13th. And the focus of that will be on firearm injury prevention. Again, also one of our public health ideas uh, efforts and a lot of exciting work taking place here at the university, uh, the Institute for Firearm Injury Prevention, co-led by our own uh, Mark Zimmerman. Uh, is is leading a lot of that work. So really looking forward to uh, you know fantastic conversation uh, with with Brandon Wolf joining us. And then lastly, it, this concludes this portion of the event. Uh, but the event continues. We will be outside. Uh, just outside the doors, upstairs in the lobby, we have some light refreshments, and then a showcase. There was a mention of posters, so uh, some of our students are involved in, the, in, in a lot of the work that was showcased today, and we'll have other work there, uh, students from public health and outside of the school. So please do join us uh, upstairs for a continuation of, of the conversations here uh, and to be able to, to talk to many of the speakers. So with that, we'll conclude. Thank you very much. <laughs>